Isaiah Martinez, who's wrestling Nolf. I'm, uh, you know, I got a few questions for Isaiah because, of course, he's going to beat him. Right. He was undefeated at this time. Undefeated. We're going to do the interview. Be fine. Nolf pins him. And I was like, I can remember the panic <laughs> because I was not prepared for this. And like I said before, interviewing is <laughs> difficult. It's really hard to, I just think it's so difficult because you want to ask the right questions. And so Nolf comes off the mat and he is so calm. I, I, he's so calm. It almost made me mad how calm he was. I'm like, you should be celebrating. You just pulled the humongous oh. upset here at U of I. And yep, pins him inside Huff Hall. I get over by him and I'm like, hey, Jason. And I, again, I'm, I'm, I go back to the like honesty card. I go, Jason, I'll be real honest with you. <laughs> I didn't think you'd win. So I don't really know what I'm going to ask you. I didn't have anything prepared. And he looks at me dead serious and just goes, um, this is where I knew Jason Nolf was a savage. Like, holy smokes. He was so calm and he goes. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Paul Garcia Show. I'm Paul Garcia, and on this show, I talk to remarkable people from the central Illinois area, or at least typically I do that. Today, I'm going to be breaking that mold a little bit, and for the first time, I'm talking to someone who is not from central Illinois. He is the voice of the Big Ten Wrestling Network, and he's also one of the most well-known commentators in the sport of wrestling, and he's from the state of Wisconsin, and his name is Shane Sparks. So, Shane, thank you so much for coming on to the show today it means a lot hey pleasure to be here thanks for having me absolutely so when i was doing my research for this i was my world was turned upside down when i found out that your name is in fact not actually shane <laughs> sparks what's the deal with that can you tell me the story behind behind the name change yeah that's funny i get uh, asked that question quite a bit when somebody recognizes it and most people will see it on facebook I'm Shane Nabel Sparks. My, my real last name is N-E-B-L, pronounced Nabel. So long story short, what happened is I did a sports talk show in Appleton, Wisconsin. It's about 20, 25 minutes uh, south of Green Bay. It was a great opportunity for me. And there was a guy that was, the, was a staple in Fox Valley Radio by the name of Jim Cast. And Jim had been there a couple of decades, mm. 20, 25 years and I went on to his show and he asked me what my name was. And I said, Shane. And he goes, what's your last name? And I said, Nabel. And he goes, nope, you're <laughs> Shane Sparks. It was literally a, that's exactly how it was. There was no conversation. There was no thought process behind it. He literally said, you're Shane Sparks, which <laughs> the rest is history. Because after that, I, I did that sports talk show for five years. And during that time, uh, we had done a wrestling radio show. So I, I become, you know, more embedded in the sport of wrestling. And then I launched a website called badgerstatewrestling.com in November of 2007. And I was on the, you know, was a one man band for the most part in a lot mm -hmm. of aspects of that business. So I just didn't want to rebrand myself. You know, it was just people had known me as Shane Sparks rolls off the tongue easier than Shane Nabel does. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just stuck with it to uh, avoid any confusion where people are like, Shane Nabel, don't know who that guy was. Well, I used to be Shane Sparks. Oh, you know, so I'm like, we'll stick with Shane Sparks. But that was it. Uh, Jim Caston was his name. And uh, it's it's funny to think about it. And I stay in touch with Jim a little bit, not as much as I'd like to. I'll probably send him this podcast. We can see the story. But uh, <laughs> little did I know that that literal 10-second conversation would, <laughs> would change my life in a lot of ways. Wow, what a story behind that name. That is awesome. And I've got to say, the name fits perfectly because you think spark, you think highly combustible material, sure. enthusiasm, and that is exactly what you bring to the table on the Big Ten Network. And just a little backstory on my part, to those of you who are listening to this, I've, I've always loved talking to people, and I've always been told I'm kind of a high-energy person to a fault. I haven't learned to control it quite as well as you have, Shane. <laughs> it's a process. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I've watched the Big Ten Network. I've seen you on TV for the majority of my life, and seeing the energy that you brought to the camera was so inspiring to me, to the point that me and my dad were like, 
always, every time you would interview someone after a match, we'd say, man, he does a fantastic job. Like, you are one of the best broadcasters and interviewers that I have ever seen. And so I just kind of want to say thanks straight off, like straight from the get go. Thanks for inspiring me to do this, Shane. Well, that's uh, that's very humbling. I mean, I, I really appreciate that. I'm glad that I've uh, you know been able to bring people joy through the sport of wrestling. I love it. I mean, I people will you know, God, you got high energy, you got so much passion. And my answer is always the same thing. You'd be the same way. You'd be the same way, Paul. Like being able to be at these events, being in wrestling rooms before. Uh, you know, during warm ups before a big duel meet, going into Carver Hawkeye with 13, 14,000, or Bryce Jordan Center when there's almost 16,000 people, you'd be excited too. I mean, it's this stuff is so fun, you know, living a, a childhood dream. But uh, thanks for the kind words that that really means a lot to me. I don't, I don't really look at myself as, as a big deal, and and it's uh, you know, kind of it kind of makes me chuckle when I hear people that are that are you know, happy and impressed. So, thank you. Absolutely. There's so many things we could, we can go in so many directions from just your response right there. But I want to start with something that you said. And that is, you said it's, it, you're living a childhood dream. I want to ask, when did this all start? When did you realize that you wanted to go into sports broadcasting? It's, I can remember it as a 10 year old, you know, as a 10 year old kid, that's what I wanted to do. I used to love base. I'm not used to, I love baseball. I've always said, Wrestling is the best sport and baseball is the greatest game. They're very different, but baseball is my first love. And I remember, you know, being a young kid, I can remember, and I should find out exactly when this was, because I could find it. There was an all-star game. I believe it was in San Diego, home of the Padres back in the mid eighties. I was probably nine, 10 years old. And I remember on the couch, my mom was a baseball fan. My dad was an outdoorsman. My mom is, is really what got me into baseball. She loved watching baseball. And I remember, I love the pageantry. And I love this in wrestling too. I love the pageantry of sporting events. So in baseball, the starting lineups of an all-star game, as weird as this sounds, it could almost bring me to tears. No, that's not weird at all, Shane. Oh, I agree it, completely. <laughs> I mean, I think about, and now that I'm older, I, I appreciate it even more. I look at these guys and I think to them, I mean, I get choked up like talking about this stuff because it's so powerful to me. Can you imagine being a major league baseball player? All the work, the sacrifice from so many people that get you to that spot and they announce your name and you get to tip your hat. Like I cannot imagine <laughs> what that must be like. So what I used to love doing, and I like playing baseball and I was okay, but you know, I wasn't, I mean, I'm five, five, seven and a half, 158 pounds. I, I wouldn't exactly say my D1 build. But, uh, <laughs> I remember one night my mom was laying on the couch. I'm on the end of the couch. And I started doing the starting lineups with, you know, with the broadcaster. And that's where I, I loved it. Uh, Major League Baseball, probably my dream job. And I might call this afternoon to see if there's any chance of setting myself up for this at any given time. The Baseball Hall of Fame inductions, when they go back and announce all the Hall of Famers that are there on the stage, give a couple highlights on their career, that, for whatever reason, I will never get through with a dry eye, which, which is, it's just so powerful to me, watching those guys. And, you know, I grew up uh, in Wisconsin watching Robin Yount, Paul Molitor, Cecil Cooper, some of the greats, but Molitor and Yount are in the Hall of Fame now. Now they're old men. I mean, they're old guys. I used to watch them when they were, you know, 30 years old. I mean, it's a long, long time ago. So uh, to answer your question, I knew at an early age. And I never had a, I never really had a plan B. My dad was a barber. So maybe I went through a phase where I wanted to be a barber. Uh, my faith's important to me. I remember wanting to maybe be a pastor once upon a time, but I wanted to be a sports broadcaster. And it, when I was in high school, there was never, and I wouldn't recommend this by the way, but it, it's worked up a little, I guess a little bit, but I never had a plan B. So my mentality was like, you know, social studies, I don't have to pay attention to that because I'll never use it. Now I would completely do that differently again. I would have competed harder in the classroom at all levels. I think that would have been valuable to me, but 
as a young kid, you're just not smart enough to figure that out all the time. So <laughs> it's all I've ever wanted to do. It's all I've ever wanted to do. Man, your passion just in general gets me fired up. And it's very interesting hearing you talk about and articulate things that I have felt myself, but I've never really heard anyone else say. Like, for instance, <laughs> I wasn't even around to watch Michael Jordan play basketball. I'm a little too young for that. But, and I don't play basketball, I don't know the first thing about basketball, but I've looked up on YouTube the starting lineup announcements. And from oh, was, they were great standing at six foot whatever from North <laughs> Carolina, I, and yep. then that music, I'm the just music, it can it get was the best, yeah, it, yeah. That, that PA guy that did the Bulls during the heyday was muddy, he was so good. I mean, that stuff, I mean. Another great memory I have, and I believe it was a guy named Terry Shockley. I'm friends with Terry, and I believe it was him that did this. But uh, I'll give you another good story when it came to the, the starting lineup kind of things. And I don't, I'm not a PA guy. Like Jason Bryant, good friend of mine, he's got that low voice. Like mm -hmm. he sounds great doing PA. But uh, 1992, Big Ten Championships, Madison, Wisconsin. My dad takes me there. And they don't do this anymore, and I wish they did because I just loved it. But I'm sitting in the stands in the old field house where the Badgers still wrestle their dual meets. Uh, Big Ten championships are now at the Kohl Center, uh, or were a few years ago. But this old building, it's got great acoustics. The microphone just booms. And I did PA for the Badgers for two or three seasons, so I got to you know, feel that mm -hmm. firsthand. But 1992, and that was... I believe to this day, it, it's one of my favorite all-time time teams, the 92 Hawkeyes. Chad Zappinal is my favorite college wrestler of all time, three-time uh, finals for the Hawkeyes, but they did face-offs. Heck Before yeah. Before the Big Ten Championships, they had all 20 Big Ten finalists on the mat, and they did face-offs, and he'd be like, you know, I mean, I, I don't remember exactly, it, it, it was like, you know, rank number two in the country, a record of blah, 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 blah. Ladies and gentlemen, for Iowa, this is Chad Zappino. Like it was free. It was just, <laughs> it was so awesome. They did that for every weight class. And I wish, I wish maybe somehow I can talk to the Big Ten and say, hey, is there any way you can do this? Scott Casper one year, this is going back a while. A while. The first Big Tens I ever covered uh, for the Big Ten Network was 2011. I believe it was 2011. 2011 or 2012 at Purdue mm -hmm. and Scott Casper, they played some music and he did like this little, I, I don't know what you want to call like a, you know, he just like did this little introduction. And I remember being on the floor and I've never been that jacked up in my life. Like, so I, I love the pageantry of sporting events because I just think it, and you talk about the Bulls starting lineups, it was I, I had never been, I'd never seen it in person, only on TV. And I was ready to jump through the roof seeing it on TV. That guy was money. He was mm -hmm. fantastic. Man, I feel like people just undervalue the, the incredible value behind a good uh, announcer, a good person who's doing the introductions. I think of the UFC and oh, yes. Bruce Buffer. Yeah. Is it Bruce Buffer? His brother is, is the boxing Bruce guy. Michael? Yeah. Well, like, anyways. One of those guys, I mean, yeah, we know who we're, I mean, we both know who we're talking about and yeah. he is, he's fantastic. And he, I mean, fantastic. Look what he's done. I mean, what, what, what's, what's awesome about what he's done also is it's always the same. You know exactly what his cadence is, what direction he's going to go. And when I think about him, the first thing I think about is fighting, you know, he <laughs> screams. It. It's, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. He does a, he does a tremendous job and, and you're right. Everybody knows that guy. Everybody knows that voice. It's it's awesome. That leads me to my next question. I actually had a next question lined up, but I want to ask you something else. Uh, you're talking about Bruce Buffer, and I know that he has like a pregame strategy. He he does a whole warm up. He has a whole system before he goes out and does some announcing for the, especially for the main event. He drinks a certain tea. He does a lot of vocal <laughs> exercises. Do you have anything like that that you do before a big meet or the Big Ten finals or anything? For me, and I don't know if I've ever told anybody this, maybe I have, maybe I haven't. One thing that I, one thing that I love about this job, it, it's probably what I love the most about it, is I get the same feeling as I did when I used to wrestle. Those, I mean, I always tell people, I get nervous 
when I'm not nervous. I want to feel the energy. I think it, it's, I focus more. But one thing that I always do, I'm a big, I've always been pretty thankful. Like I don't, I don't take this for granted at all. Like I know it could be over tomorrow. I'm not arrogant enough to think nobody else could do it. And I, I'm really trying to appreciate the ride and, and trying to soak it all in. So I do a couple of things. The first thing I do, I do a few things. Anytime I'm in a car, when I'm driving to the arena, I listen to Back in Black by ACDC. Because if you've ever been to Carver Hawkeye Arena, when they pay, play Back in Black before the Hawks come out, it's the coolest thing ever. Okay, again, going back to that pageantry stuff. Yeah. I pay, I, and, and I used to, when I, I graduated high school in 1994, in those days, and you wouldn't even probably know what this is, there was a thing called a Walkman <laughs> on cassette tapes. So the, I had a, what I called a cassette hype tape. Mm-hmm. And the first song I played was Thunderstruck by ACDC. It's one of my favorite songs ever. So I love ACDC, but I play Back in Black on the way to the arena. Kind of gets me, kind of gets me in the mood, of, you know, gets me ready to compete almost. Mm-hmm. Then the other thing I do is when I get to an arena, and this goes back to a story from 1987. I was outside of County Stadium going to a Tigers Brewer game. And I remember getting out of the car, was with my my mom and dad and some family friends. And my mom caught me gazing at County Stadium. And she asked me, like, what are you, what are you looking at? What are you doing? And I said, I look at looking at it. I'm 12 years old. And I said, this is what I want to do when I get older. And my mom, very matter of factly, said, that's what you're going to do. And that was the end of the conversation. That's and a supportive I, mom. I like that. My mom was extremely supportive. My dad was extremely supportive. Wonderful people. So just supported me. Didn't pressure me. Didn't cram stuff down my throat. They were just there. Unconditional love. Listened. Nothing fancy. But looking back on it, having kids of my own, not that easy to execute necessarily as a parent. So I, I, my mom is the most wonderful human being on the, on the planet, but I remember that. So when I go to an event, I like to, I like to like go back to my 12 year old self. If I'm at a big duel, any duel for that matter, I, I look at that arena and I think to myself, man, this is the coolest thing. Like you get to do this. This is your dream go out and get it, like, enjoy this today. And then the other thing that I do, it's mainly the stuff I do is mental. It's not necessarily anything with my voice. The other thing that I I always do, the one that comes to mind is a location inside Carver Hawkeye. Uh, I, every arena, I know where I'm going, but consistently Mm -hmm. it's this one in in Carver Hawkeye inside the tunnel And the tunnel is an amazing, when you're walking down the tunnel at Carver, it's one entrance and one exit inside that arena. It's in a corner. So you can see, you know, nobody else can see what's going on in this tunnel, but I've been back there when I've seen Penn State walk down the tunnel, getting ready for battle. Iowa getting ready for battle. Oklahoma State coming down. Michigan. I mean, I've seen numerous teams make that path. And I I think to myself, this is the the big leagues. Like these guys are so good. This is the top 1%. And again, I go back to stories like i i watched like whoever it might be and i think there was a time they were probably eight years old in a wrestling room wearing tennis shoes and now look at them now they're walking down the tunnel at carver hawkeye getting ready to wrestle in front of 14 15 000 people and then to take it one step further i think about guys that i know got big matchups like maybe it's marinelli and vincenzo joseph and i'll watch those guys walk and i'm thinking to myself they know they're going to go to a, a a crazy place here pretty soon. What are they thinking right now? And I kind of think the same thing from a broadcast standpoint. When I'm walking down that tunnel, I, I'm thinking the exact same thing. Like, got two and a half hours right now. I gotta, I gotta be on. I, how good am I gonna be today? So there's a bathroom in that tunnel, and I go in there, and it's it's my friends joke about it because people that know me know I do this. It's a self-talk in the mirror. Usually I'll I'll put my tie on. And then it's a self-talk and I'll just stare at myself in the eyes and I'll say, it's go time. Like, this is what you love to do. This is what you love. I mean, I talk out loud. I go, this is what you love to do. Now let's go out and get it done. Go get it, man. And, I, and that's it. I, I, 
I love oh, it. Oh man. And I actually right now I'm getting fired up and it's not the You're same. telling me. <laughs> there's no feeling, there's no feeling than when it's live and it's real. But uh I, I enjoy telling the story because it, it it gets me gets me jacked up. But that's that's a lot of the things I do are all mental. It's a lot of mental preparation. And I think it's it's mainly tied into gratitude because I would say this. I'm not saying I'm more thankful than anybody to be there, but I would also say there's nobody more thankful than I am because I, I, I pinch myself every time I do this because it really is, it's something you cannot explain. You've got to experience it. You got to experience it because it's, it's pretty special. Wow. Beautifully put. And I think it's a beautiful thing seeing you, you're unique, I think, because you bring in not, not only high enough level of energy to these wrestling meets, but you're also bringing the right kind of energy. It's high level and it's the right kind of energy for wrestling. It's beautiful then when, when the commentary matches the level of wrestling going on. It, so, so well done there. And that leads me to believe, well, you said you did have some wrestling or you did wrestle a little bit in your childhood. And upon my research, I found that you were actually pretty good. You got third place in high school in the state tournament and second place in high school in the state tournament. Just how serious were you in your personal career in the sport of wrestling? You know what? I, again, I kind of go back to my parents. They didn't shove it down my throat. And I, and I appreciate that. I started as a first grader. I was seven years old. The old Goodrich High School in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. I took third place. I uh, lost my first match. Don't even really know what I was doing there. I don't remember being at a whole lot of practices, if any, before that. They just kind of threw me to the wolves, which it, it worked. But there was just something about it. And I don't even, I don't, I, it, it's, it's definitely the one-on-one. -on -one. I, I think it was James Green. Uh, James Green had something on social media recently that I found very interesting. And I never thought about it. But he asked people, how old were you? when you realized you were competitive. And I think back to being a young kid, whether it was, you know, flashcards in like second or third grade, I wanted to win flashcards. I was in Cub Scouts as a little kid and they'd have like contests on selling maybe tickets for a raffle or some kind. I always wanted to win. And I think getting that first taste of winning was like some people say, I hated to lose more than I loved to win. I don't think that was the case with me. I liked winning. And I remember once when I was a senior in high school, Dave Lauber was our assistant. He was our, he was our vice principal. And at that time, and I wouldn't do this again, but I'm cutting weight. I'm miserable. I would never do that again. If there's one message I give on this podcast, enjoy the sport. Enjoy it. Don't cut weight. Worry about getting better in your technique. I didn't get any better. I was too worried about cutting weight. It was, I would never do it again. And like I said, I wasn't, I wasn't enjoying the sport. Well, Shane, you wrestled at, I think 103 pounds, like I did. three of four years, right? Or I, all I, four. It was all four. So here's, here's what happened there. So I'll, I'll, I'll tie this up with, with, with Mr. Lauber once he asked me, yeah. he see me doing this and he goes, why do you, why do you do this? He's like, I see you like constantly working out. You're disciplined. What, what, what's the deal? And I, I, I remember thinking, man, I never really thought about it. I never really thought about why I do this. And I was 18 year old kid. And I, I, I said, to him, I'm like, let me think about this for a little bit. And I'll let you know. And I, I thought about it and I figured out what it is. It's this. It's a referee raising your hand for three seconds. The feeling that I got from that, knowing the work I put in. And that's what makes the sport so great. The individual aspect is what, what made me fall in love with it. Knowing I was going to get out of it what I put into it. And team sports have value, but I'm, I would have a very hard time depending on somebody else who I might know is not doing the right things and living the right lifestyle. Mm -hmm. If that's going to bring me down, there's going to be a problem there. But uh, when I was in high school, I weighed... 81 pounds as a freshman Jeez. and I wrestled varsity. They had just moved. It used to be 98 pounds, but they moved the weight and they bumped it up to 103. So at that point, it did not help me. I weighed 81 pounds. I wrestled varsity. The minimum weight was 88. 
and I'd have to drink seven pounds of water. Sometimes I'd weigh 82 and I don't have to drink six pounds of water, but I'd go out there and just get throttled. The second half of my freshman year, I think I was six and seven in my final 13 matches. To this day, one of my most proud accomplishments, because I was, you know, in middle school, I didn't, I wasn't like a world beater, but I didn't lose a lot. I mean, in eighth grade, it was a small sample size of maybe, I don't know, 10 to 15 matches, but I didn't lose, you know, on the little middle school dual schedule we had. So I was used to winning and that was hard. I mean, I remember that was really tough. My sophomore year, I weighed 93. My junior year, I weighed about 103. I was, it was fantastic. Mm. My senior year, I walked around at about 113, 114, but I was growing, fighting mother nature. I never do that again. And the, the biggest issue I will always have with myself, the reality is if I'm being honest, and I hate admitting this because it still ticks me off, and this is 30 years ago, mm. why did I cut down to 103? You know why I cut down to 103? I was looking for the easier path. And if somebody were to ask me, what's something you've learned in the last 20 years with high level wrestlers? I know what it is. Like there's, there's a couple things that really stand out to me. And one of them is the great ones don't want the easy path. The great ones want the great ones. I mean, that's, I'm not, I'm sure there's anxiety there, but that's what they want. That's why they're, they challenge themselves yeah. and they're not afraid to fail. That, that's another thing I've learned in my life. You cannot be afraid to fail. And I've struggled with that in different aspects. Like I don't want to fail. So maybe I, maybe I don't pursue an opportunity as hard because I'm afraid of getting rejected. I'm afraid of failing. You can't, wrestling's got to be the same way. I mean, go out there mm -hmm. and compete to the best of your ability and you either win or you don't. And you got to accept that. But a lot of times you get better and you grow by losses. I'm a big believer in that too. Mm -hmm. It would, it would have been, it would have served me far better to bump up to 112, which by the way, the kids in the final, the kids in the 112 final that year, I beat both of them. So, oh just, no, I, I should have went to 112. I, I think I would have won it. I mean, I, with every, I, I think I would have won it, but it, it's just not how it worked out, but it's a lesson. It's just a lesson that you try all these things. What makes the sport so great is it's, you got to take this sport and apply it to other aspects of your life. And I've done that very well in some aspects. And quite frankly, in other aspects, I've fallen on my face and failed miserably. But when I look at sports, again, I'm 45 years old now. It's just a perspective thing. You get older, you get wisdom. And uh, I think so many people miss, they just miss the ball on youth sports. And, you know, we're talking about wrestling here. They just really, unfortunately, don't really get it, you, you know, get what it's all about. So, but yeah, I, I had to drink a bunch of water growing up or, or, you know, freshman year, sophomore year. And then, then the, that last year was, was tough and I would definitely not do it again. Right. Yeah. And it seems like cutting weight has kind of gone to the wayside as in, in consequently wrestling talent has gone up noticeably at the high school level and yes. at the college level. Now that they don't have to worry about cutting weight and you don't see quite as many skeleton looking dudes at the D one level that are pasty white and look like they're dying. And the that's what a guy called me when I was a senior in high school, there was a guy uh, that I, I wish I remember who it was, but that's what, that's what he nicknamed me the skeleton. And it was a guy oh, from another God. school. He's like, and, and, and it was, I mean, man, I mean, it's not, I mean, at 18 years old growing, you know, 103 pounds, I think 106 was the, the allowance. I think my last time I weighed in was 106, but uh, yeah, I would not cutting weight. It's just, it's just not worth it. It's not healthy. It's not, it, there's so many negatives now. Hey, maybe you got to cut a couple pounds. That's one thing, but mm -hmm. enjoy the sport. And I, I just think cutting weight burns people out. You want to, you want to burn out quick, cut, cut weight. You'll burn out fast. Mm hmm for sure. Yeah. And then like you were saying also, there's so many metaphors that for life that you get literally in wrestling. I mean, life is a lot like a wrestling match. And even biblically, I know sure. that I mean, if you reap what you sow. I, I always like to say that um yeah. Jacob, only, sport, only sport mentioned in the Bible is wrestling. Exactly. That's what yeah. I was going to say. <laughs> Jacob wrestles the angel. Yes. Yes. He didn't yep. play him in a game of hoops. <laughs> exactly. Good point. Yeah. And um 
Well, anyways, I'd like to kind of switch gears a little bit sure. and say that, as I mentioned in this talk, I, I'm kind of starstruck by, you know, who I'm talking to. I'm talking to the voice of, of Big Ten Wrestling, who I've watched and looked up to for so long. And I feel like you probably understand what I'm feeling a little bit because I've heard of a story where when you were starting one of your broadcasting business ventures, one of your first guests on a show was Dan Gable. And I also want to mention that when I reached out to you, you could have given me the cold shoulder and I would have understood completely. You're a busy guy and that, that would have been completely normal. However, you said, uh, I'd be happy to. How about next Wednesday? And I was like, whoa, okay. Like that was easier than I thought. And yeah, you're just really nice about it. And anyways, I was wondering if you could tell that story about when you had Dan Gable on as one of your first guests. For, for sure. It's, it's, it is a, it's a great story. Um, and I would say this first, you know, I've been in your shoes before young guy. I mean, you do a great job. You're asking good questions. You're prepared. I'm, I'm really impressed with you. This has been a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I think it's so important to be kind. Like I just, there are so many great cliches. And one of them is like, how do you make somebody feel walking away? I mean, if I, if I could have any superpower, any superpower, it would be to meet somebody one time and never forget their name. And I'm bad at it. I just struggle with remembering names and it bothers me. I don't need to be invisible. I don't need to fly. Forget it. I don't need that. I wish I could remember somebody's name because it's so powerful when, you know, when, when you can just execute that make somebody feel good. So I'm just a big believer in you can be the best broadcaster in the world. You can be the best wrestler, whatever. That stuff is not that important. Quite frankly, it's just not that important. How do you make somebody feel? How do you treat people? That's the kind of stuff that I want. That's what I want to be known as like a nice guy. The guy's a good, good dude. That's what it comes down to. But the Gable story and he's another guy, by the way, that in my experiences with Coach Gable, he's been phenomenal towards me. And I'm a big believer, too. Like, I think about guys right now. Kyle Snyder comes to mind. Um, I'm going to miss people here for sure. Jordan Burroughs, Kyle Snyder, Jaden Cox. Those are a few superstars that come to mind right now. Okay. David Carr. I spent some time with David Carr last week from Iowa State. Mm -hmm. If these guys are nice to people. Right. If these guys are super nice to everybody, super nice, super nice, super nice. Like if they're going to be nice, you certainly better fall in line. Like these yeah. guys to me are like culture changes. Like I can guarantee you and I can't speak, speak to this, like, but I'm pretty confident. I'll bet David Carr is a culture changer at Iowa State. Like if David Carr falls in, like if he does things a certain way, the way he goes about his business and you know, both on and off the mat, you better fall in line. I mean, that's why I think those, those kind of guys are so significant to programs and it happens in high school too. If your best guy is your hardest worker and we'll call it your nicest guy in the team, a great leader, Sammy Sasso. I could, I've heard some stories about Sammy Sasso that'll make your hair on your arm stand up. Like when those guys are those guys, it sets the culture. It's so important. It's so important. But anyways, finally get back to, I'm, I'm rambling on. No, now. oh man, I, you're doing great. I wish we had tons of time because I want to, I want to oh, dive I, deep into every single thing it, that you're saying. The stuff is so, it's so impactful. Yeah. But Gable, I'm doing an interview with him. It was a Tuesday afternoon. I remember it would have been in November of no, November or early December of 2007. And I'm, you know, much like you, I don't wing interviews. Like I'm not just winging stuff. I got to, you know, have some questions and, you know, have do, do some research and lead into it where it's just like your interview style. I, I really like it. So I, I spend probably an hour prepping and he, I'll never forget this. I'm in Appleton, Wisconsin at the corner of Calumet and 441. I can't tell you stuff from 10 minutes ago. But I can remember this from 2007. And I get a call on my phone. I don't recognize the number. And it's Dan Gable making sure that we were still on for that afternoon. And I remember. <laughs> you did that to me today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, but I, and that's probably where I got it from. It's like, again, if, if, if this is how Coach Dan Gable does things, I'm gonna, I want to 
do what he does. Because again, if, if he does it, then I should be doing it because he's, you know, a billion times more, you know, impactful than I am. So I remember thinking to myself, like, it really struck me like Dan Gable's going out of his way to make sure some like nobody is, is good. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. So then I get to my house and we're ready to do the interview. I call his house up. His wife, Kathy answers the phone and says, yeah, Dan's expecting your call. Give me a minute here to turn off the call waiting. So you guys don't get interrupted. And again, I'm like, like, this is incredible. So I remember the interview, my intro, and I won't get the stats right. I, I don't remember the stats, but it was all his credentials. So I'm like, set it up. I'm like, I don't remember how I exactly brought it in, but I remember saying like, you know, whatever it was, you know, three-time high school state champion, da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. 15 time big, I think he won 15 or 20 big 10. I mean, it was all these unbelievable yeah. accolades. And then I ended it with saying, He's simply known as Gable. Dan Gable goes, wow, what an intro. And we're not on a Zoom call like this. It's audio (laughs) only. So I stand up. He can't see me. And I'm like, (laughs) I'm so fired up. I'm like, oh, my God, this is the greatest thing ever. Because I'm already thinking about, you know, with this being early stage of the business, how I'm going to use that clip. I'm already thinking like, how are we going to, we're going to use this clip to market and make promos. It's going to be the greatest thing ever. And then I look down <laughs> and I realized I didn't hit record. And it was like, no, no, oh no. So now <laughs> I got to stay composed and I'm not going to do it again because I just, I didn't, I wasn't going to do it again. If I, yeah, I just wasn't going to do it again. And then I, at that point, I had to just really, compose myself because I was so ticked off at myself. Like, come on. And, uh, he was great. And, and, and fortunately I've spent quite a bit of time with him, uh, over the years and, uh, you know, consider him a pretty good friend and he's another, I can still text him. He gets back to me pretty much all the time, pretty quick. So I just, uh, I will always appreciate, you know, again, you look at what a great wrestler and coach he was, but to me, my, my first story, anytime I hear the name Dan Gable, will go back to the way that he treated me. That'll mm-hmm. be that'll that'll always be my number one story about him. And what heck of a story to have about him. That that was incredible. Yeah, I mean, it was, that made my blood pressure that. rise. <laughs> oh man, gotta hit record. Gotta hit record. <laughs> Dude, I'm checking right now to make sure I'm recording. I am, <laughs> thank the Lord. But uh, so so you've talked to legends like Gable. You've probably talked to more wrestling legends than mostly anyone on the planet. Like as far as United States wrestling legends go, you've talked to, and these guys are quite literally my biggest role models throughout my life. A lot of the the good things about who I am, I can accredit to these guys, Dan Gable, Tom Brands, Terry Brands, Tom Ryan, Barry Davis. I mean. I just read about them, watched YouTube videos, heard stories about them, and their influence, I've never met them personally, but their influence on me was more powerful and more positive than any anyone I knew actually personally in the real world. So they are just incredible people. I love the way that they tick, and you've talked to them personally, and I want to ask if you have any idea or any guess as to some common trend among them, some common character trait that makes these typically division one head coaches so incredible. Do you have any guesses to that? And I, man, that's a really good question. I think, I mean, I think the the common denominators are probably just like commitment, hard work. I mean, I think kind of maybe basic, but, extremely difficult to consistently execute. I I think probably be a good way to explain it. Um, You know, when I think about, you know, Tom Ryan is, he's another one of those guys. He's just so accommodating. You know, he's, he's been fantastic for me. Um, Big fan of uh, you got, you got his, you got his book. Yeah. There you go. Incredible book. Yep. Yep. Tom is not sponsored this show either. So (laughs) (laughs) Tom's a great guy. I mean, Tom is a, you know, does what's best for wrestling. I mean, he, he goes, he'll, he'll do anything, you know, outside of Ohio state, he's just a great promoter. And, you know, you talk about the, the CEOs, 
you know, you look what he's built there at Ohio state with the, uh, the, uh, the Jennings wrestling facility. It's insane. His, you know, he'll be gone for a hundred years. And, and I think his impact will still be felt at Ohio state. No doubt. I mean, that's, that's pretty crazy to say, but I, I believe that. Um, just a lot of really good guys. I mean, just guys that are great at what they do. Don't take shortcuts. I mean, to get to that level, you, you got to be all in. I mean, Tom and Terry, I always, I mean, I, I was in high school when they were kicking butt in college. So the, they'll always be, those are guys, anytime I'm around them. Like I remember once being in Tom Brand's office a couple years back, it was just Whoa. him and I, and I'm like, like pinching myself. Like if you would have told me going back to those 1992 big tens, I turned, you know, just, I was 16 years old. If you would have said to me, yeah, in 20 years from now, you'll be in Tom Brand's office. I would have been like, man, I, I have no idea what's, what happened, but I'll take it. You know, so those are the, you know, that's always, it's kind of funny. You know, that, that always, I mean, Tom and Terry are great. And Barry yeah. Davis, one of the best people I've met in the sport, period. He, he is, is so entertaining. I love him. He, is, the, he is such a nice guy. I could, I could tell you Barry Davis stories for a solid hour. We could do Barry Davis stories for an hour. I told a Barry Davis story um, this week, uh, yesterday. I told the Barry Davis story yesterday. It, it was a one of my favorite Barry Davis stories. I got, I have three or four really good Barry Davis stories. All right, you're so, you're you're telling me too much now. I've got to ask. <laughs> I'll try not to take too much of your time, but could you tell one Barry Davis story because that guy is he's got you know some what? stories, man. He's hilarious too. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you one. I'll give you, I'll give you th this, this one's not the most, I mean, I got some that are just off the charts, like really, like I got one and, and I, I'm not, I got some time. So I, I could tell if you, I don't know how long you normally typically go, but I'll, I'll give you the one that was the most powerful for me is I got divorced about eight years ago. Okay. Difficult time. I of course, mean, yeah. Hard time. You know, one thing I, I would say about divorce is your your best self doesn't always come out. You, you're, you're just you don't want to. You know, it's another one of those things you want to avoid at all costs. But anyways, Barry Davis would call me up and just check to see how I was doing, and that meant everything to me. It meant everything to me. Um, Barry Davis, I remember when I was doing PA for the Badgers. When he was a head coach. What's that? Is he still the head? He's not still the head coach, obviously. Yeah, nope, nope, nope. So he, Chris Bono has been, is there now, but, uh, and I still stay in touch with Barry, but I'd be like, I, I'd be coming back from a rest, a high school tournament with my business. It'd be like a 10 o'clock on a Saturday night. And Barry would call me up and be like, uh, Hey Shane, uh, just want to make sure that you're bringing your son tomorrow. And at the time, Logan was now he's 17. He was probably, 10 years old, but just like out of the blue Saturday night, 10 o'clock, there's Barry just, yeah, you know, you're bringing your son, like, it's like, you got to duel the next day, Barry. I'm sure you got a lot of things that are on your mind, but you're calling me up to see if I'm going to bring my son because he told me that he thought that was really good time that we could spend together. Barry Davis. And this is the most, the biggest compliments I can give anybody in wrestling. And I mentioned it about Gable before, and I would say the same thing about Barry Davis. Barry Davis is one of the most successful heralded wrestlers in the history of the Iowa Hawkeyes, mm -hmm. which is, of course, one of the most tradition rich programs in college wrestling history. He's one of their top guys. OK. When I hear the name Barry Davis and I swear this is crazy, but it's the truth. I don't think about wrestling. And it wasn't always like that. When I first met him, it was like. Oh my God, this is Barry Davis. I mean, starstruck, like, oh my gosh, this is Barry Davis. And as I've gotten to know Barry now over, I don't know, it's probably been, I don't know, 50, gosh, it's been a long time. I mean, I was going to say 10 years, probably closer to 20. Um, I, I, I don't think about Barry Davis, the wrestler anymore. It always goes back to Barry Davis, the man, which mm -hmm. is, that's pretty powerful. I mean, it says a lot about him and I'm sure I'm not the only guy that thinks like that about him. He's, he's the, he's great, great, great guy.
That is awesome. Wow. It's, it's so sharply contrast the way he competed. He was oh, vicious. Yes. He's a, he's a very, I, I would describe Barry off the mat, gentle, caring, graceful, like exactly. You would never use any of those adjectives describing his wrestling. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, I mean, it, it, it's really interesting. Another guy that comes to mind recently is a guy like Zane Rutherford. Mm-hmm. Zane Rutherford punishing on a wrestling man, high pace, punishing. Like Zane Rutherford punished guys at the top position. Think about his bow and arrow. Like, oh, I thought he was going to snap him in half oh, and break gosh, some ribs. Like he couldn't even watch it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and when he'd come off the mat, it would always blow me away. Like what a nice guy he was. I'd be like, it, it just always struck me as it was just funny to me. I'm like, this guy just basically went out and almost killed somebody. And now he's just the normalest, nicest guy ever. Like literally 20 seconds later, just being able to flip a switch. A lot of those guys can flip a switch. Mm-hmm. You know, when it's go time, it's go time. And they're able to do it. Yeah, it, it's so interesting. It, it's crazy. It, it's almost like they balance each other out. If you're going to be that vicious on the mat, you you almost have to be a little gentle off the mat, you know? At some guys, <laughs> I feel like Tony Ramos was an interesting person because I never met him personally. He seems kind of nice, but I think he said he kind of played the part of the of the bad guy a little bit. Yeah, too. yep, yep. But he said, I, you know, I don't have many friends. He, you know, he would give a mean interview a little bit, but he seems like a secretly nice guy as well. Tony so, Ramos is one of the best guys you'll ever meet. Yeah. Like, awesome kid. I mean, awesome. I remember... I mean, I got some Ramos stories as well. He's he's doing this on the Big Ten Network for 10 years. When people ask me, like, you know, a couple of guys that stand out, Ramos is in that conversation because he was always a great interview. He was a fan favorite. The crowd loved him. Oh, he awesome, stepped up awesome. on he stepped up inside that arena in some of the biggest matches, whether he was beating Jordan Oliver or you know, pinning a couple of Penn State guys like Tony Ramos. He was tough. The stare down was legendary. Legendary. Oh, you talk fantastic. about theatrics and the drama. It, it was, was fantastic. He played it up a little bit, but I think he was, again, flip a switch. I think it was 100% genuine. He wanted to slit your throat out, you know, inside that circle. But what I what I came to really appreciate about Tony was, and him and I have talked about this story. I've told this story a million times, and I've, he knows it well. Uh, Tony Ramos' autograph isn't worth anything. It's not worth anything. Because everybody's got one. <laughs> everybody's got a Tony Ramos autograph. I would watch him with the fans. You know, he was great at interacting with the fans. There was a, a picture with him and Logan Steber after Steber just beat him in a final. Like, I've seen that. I saw your the, thing on YouTube about that. That's he incredible. He, McCormick, he wrestles at Virginia. Like, that couldn't have been easy, but he did it anyways. Um, I just, I, I really like Tony. I mean, I, I've had a lot of conversations with him. Great guy, you know, great father, husband. I mean, he does, he, he's awesome. I'm, I'm really proud of him, uh, what he's been able to do. I think there's going to be some big things in his coaching future when it's all said and done. But uh, Ramos was awesome. Awesome guy. And I remember my, my one, one of my favorite interview stories, it's probably my favorite interview story, was Ramos wins the Big Tens at, in Madison. That would have been, 2014, I believe it was. Did he beat Tyler Graff? I beat Tyler Graff. Yep. And him and Graff had some battles. They mm-hmm. had some battles. And Ramos was just so mentally tough. I, I mean, I think Ramos inside, you know, between the ears, he was tough. I mean, Tony Ramos was not giving an inch to anybody. Like he, he believed he was going to win no matter what. And, and that's he, Tony Ramos's mindset. It's fascinating to me. I've got to have him on the show because he's from oh, Illinois. So it would yes, be- he's in Illinois. I believe he was Glenbard North, I think. Yes, he was. I, I yep. think. So Ramos wins the Big Tens. And at that time, and I really appreciated this from an interview standpoint, I like, I'm not a big fan of getting guys off the mat. If I can get 60 seconds with a guy or a couple minutes with a guy, like when I did interviews at Fargo, a lot of times I'd have a couple minutes with a kid you can learn a lot from somebody in two minutes and and you can develop some rapport and it's just good for the interview. They can calm down a little bit, collect themselves. I really liked the way we did that. So we were set up in 
you know, outside the arena a little bit in one of the tunnels. Two wooden chairs there. I'm on one of them. Ramos comes back and he sits down and he, he takes a deep breath. And it was a different side that I had seen from him up to this point. And he takes a deep breath and he's like, <sighs> finally on that wall. It was like, he's finally on that wall as a big 10 champion. And you could see like the, you could see like just the relief as much as anything, the relief that he had. Mm-hmm. And I will never forget. <laughs> I look at him and I'll, I'll clean this up. I'll clean it up. So sure. I <laughs> but I looked at Ramos and they're like, you know, I got somebody in my ear and they're like, you know, 30 seconds till you guys come on. Okay. So I looked at Ramos and I go, and I was dead serious. And I go, and I've used this, I've used this with other guys since, but Ramos was the first. And I go, man, Tony, timing's everything. And he's just kind of like, you know, looking at me like, you know, where are you going with this? Probably. Yeah, I go, and I can hear the people that are like, you know, 20 seconds were going on. <laughs> and I go, timing's everything, because if we were the same age, you wouldn't win crap. <laughs> and he looked at, you could tell, he kind of looked at me. We both start dying laughing, and it's literally, you guys are on in five seconds. Boom, oh, that's genius. Almost, and he was just, I, I learned something with that interview, because I just learned how you know, again, you just kind of try to relate to a kid. Maybe in, in some of those situations, somebody will tell you something too about, you know, you know, like, oh, this match was big. He crushed me last time. Or, you know, I did this for so-and-so, you know, my grandma's sick. I mean, just, you can learn little things about a kid or, or about an athlete and then try to take that angle because interviewing is such a difficult thing to do. Like it is, interviewing is 10 times harder than play-by-play. It's not even close. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, it's not even close because from a preparation standpoint, you know, play by play is preparation and calling what you see. It's Mm -hmm. not like, I mean, preparation to me is everything. When you do an interview with somebody, you can prepare properly. You can ask a great question and you can still, you know, maybe that's just not their personality. They don't like, you know, not comfortable being in front of a camera or microphone in their mouth. I mean, you just don't know. And it can be kind of a flop. You don't know what you're going to get, you know? So that's interviewing is a, such a, such a skill. I mean, I'm, I got a long ways to go, but it's, I'm motivated to get better because it's such a science. Interviewing is a science for sure. Mm -hmm. I think you're on the leading front of that though. You you seem to bring the best out of people, ask the right questions and not stutter. It's really a work of art. I appreciate that. I mean, I, I think there's aspects of it. I do very well. I'll tell you a guy that I love listening to interview is Kyle Klingman, who's now, he was with track wrestling. Now he's with, with flow wrestling. Kyle Klingman has a very unique interview style that is very much, I'm really good friends with Kyle. So I know his personality. And I talked to him last week. I talked to him weekly, but I told him last week, I said, Kyle, I got to tell you, you do a phenomenal job interviewing because he's, if you ever get a chance to listen to Kyle Klingman do interviews, He's got his own unique style and it's very good. He, he might be my favorite guy to listen to do interviews. Might be Kyle Klingman. He's fantastic. Well noted way to give him a shout out on here too. And he's one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet for sure. He's great. This is a side question of mine that I've always been kind of curious to ask you. Believe it or not, for quite a while, I've told, you know, my dad and some wrestling friends, like, I'm going to have Shane Sparks on (laughs) and I'm going to ask him this question. It's nothing juicy, really. But so you're with the Big Ten Network and everyone enjoys seeing you talking to these guys. You do a great job and everything. Where do you go come NCAA finals? How's come you? Know, I hope I don't offend anyone when I ask this one. But sure. how's come you're not interviewing the guys after the matches? I think that would be pretty yeah. great. Yeah. So I mean, it's you know one thing I think is very valuable also that I I'm I'm just a big believer in is you you know there's a way to do things. You don't go behind people's back. You don't step on people. Tim Johnson is one of the best people I've ever met in my life. Mm. So Tim Johnson, long time play by play, the guy's in the hall of fame. He's one of the, he's a legend. And I mean, obviously you want these opportunities, but there's a way to go about it. And Tim Johnson, when I came in 
to the Big Ten Network 10 years ago, him and Jim Gibbons both really took me in, took me under their wing, helped mm. me. And I've just been a big believer in patience. Like I, I'm a, I mean, I think another great line is God's timing's perfect. You might not like it. You might not understand it, but his timing's perfect. And that's not always easy because I want to do more. Like, of course I want to do the NCAA finals on ESPN. Mike Cousins does it. Mike does a great job. And he's another great guy. Quinn Kesnick does the interviews. I've got to know Quinn. I also understand how difficult that job is. And I have his back if anybody ever attacks him. Because that's <laughs> a hard job. He's got the hardest job, make no mistake about it. Make no mistake about it. He's got the hardest job. But, you know, now this last year, the Big Ten, uh, you know, kind of, you know, they, they really kind of, I don't know how you, they just gave me more opportunities. And, you know, Tim's been so supportive and I'm just really glad the way I, I've, you got to be patient. You don't, again, I say, I, I'll say it again. There's a way to do things. You don't step on people. So I think, I think I was going to be on the ESPN broadcast in some capacity, in some capacity two years ago, it was happening. And then COVID happened. Mm. Then they got a new crew. They got a new crew this year. And based on COVID, it was kind of a skeleton crew. But I talked to the guys there and I, I think I'm going to get in next year and at some level, it might be, it, I'm, I don't know, but it could be a pregame show, you know, something like that, but you got to get your foot in the door and uh, you know, we'll see what happens. I mean, I've gotten so many great opportunities. Yeah. You want them all, but you know, the other thing too, that I've learned as I've gotten older and I, and this works and I, I, I believe this being happy for other people, hmm. be happy for other people. Like, absolutely. Like Jason Knapp does the Olympics for NBC. Again, common denominator here. Great guy. I think that makes it easier, if I'm being honest. When somebody's really nice, it's like, how can you not? Like, right? I mean, if the guy mm -hmm. was a complete jerk, it'd be like, screw this guy. Like, I want that job. And you know what? I'm going to do this, this, and this to get it. So, and Jason Knapp is a, professional broadcaster i mean he's a pro's pro he does a lot of big stuff um but yeah would i love to do that job someday of course i would but i'm also happy for him that he gets to do it because he does a great job and he's phenomenal um mm -hmm. my cousins like i said before on espn does a great job and i found myself I, I think one thing that's really cool is i'll help mike if he'd need it i'll do whatever he'd need I, I, he's helped me out. I mean, he helped get me in touch with the people at ESPN. So it's like, I think that's really important too. I mean, we're all in this together at the end of the day and you know, you work hard, you treat people right and good things will happen to you. I don't think it's any more complicated than that. Right. I think it's that simple. You work hard, you be nice to people and good things will happen. And I would add this. I don't, have a day of TV training, and I should even be saying this out loud. Because people are going, <laughs> what? I don't have television broadcasting experience. If I'm being real honest, half the time, I don't really know what I'm necessarily doing. I really don't. So what does that tell you? I must be, and I'm, I'm proud of this, I must be a halfway decent guy to work with. Right. I mean, I think you ultimately have to be able to at higher levels, you better, better be able to execute. You got to be talented, and do your work and, and, and get it done. But I think if I were to talk to young broadcasters, being being nice and being a good guy to work with is more important than being a quote unquote great broadcaster, because I think you can find I think there's a lot of great broadcasters, There's a ton of them. So, so why do certain guys get to certain points and certain guys don't? It's my opinion that it's, do people like working with you? Are you coachable? Right. Do you listen? Um, those, those things are super important. You know, figure that out first and then, then, then figure out how you're going to get to where you need to go, but you got to know how to treat people.
Absolutely. Yeah. It's just one of those things in the business world that, that happens to be true. A lot of the times people think that they're certain majors, certain degrees, that's what's going to get them to the promised land. But oftentimes we find that it's a matter of networking and who you know. It's and then like you said, um, just like how, how fun are you to work with? How much do people like working with you? And things like that are oftentimes more important than they're your huge. specific accolades. They're huge. Timing is everything. I mean, the way that I got into the Big Ten, the timing of it was <clears> impeccable. <throat> like, hmm. so many things have happened for me. I mean, I've been so fortunate, so fortunate. I mean, if I died tomorrow, it was a great ride. I mean, it was a great ride. I've gotten to experience things that I never in my wildest dreams would have ever imagined. I mean, ever imagined. So, you know, I've gotten, I've had so many things work out. The timing has been great. Meeting certain people at the right times. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty crazy. I mean, it, it really is. It's, it's extremely humbling because I don't have one of those stories. I got about 20 of them <laughs> and all 20 of them have mattered. I mean, from the first time I was, you know, 10 years old, I, I grew up in Ripon, Wisconsin, town of 7,000 people. There was a little league tournament that was down the road for 12 year olds. So I'm like 10 years old and they let me get behind the microphone and, and do the starting lineups and incorporate a little play by play. Wow. I'm sure not everybody there wanted to hear some loud mouth 10 year old doing that. But <laughs> there were some people that gave me the opportunity to do it. And that is really where my, uh, you know, love of sports broadcasting really, you know, really took, you know, really was rooted. And to those people like, man, they, 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 I'll be forever grateful to them. And they, there's a lot of people that probably don't know what kind of impact they've had. I mean, that's one thing I've tried to do or want to do, want to do more of is, is reminding those people, thanking mm -hmm. those people. And, uh, you know, my, my, uh, youth wrestling coach, Herm Leitz is his name. He, uh, he's my first wrestling coach. And I, you know, I texted him before the big tens and just said, Hey, you know, I, I know he's real proud of me. And I'm just like, I want you to know Herm, like when I'm doing this, like, I hope you own a piece of it. I hope you own a piece of it. My high school coach is same thing. I hope they own a piece of it because all these people have helped me develop a passion for wrestling. So it's, uh, it takes an army as they say, and that's the truth. Starts with mom and dad, as I said before, your community, your coaches, your teammates, people in the professional world. It's, it's, it's pretty remarkable when, uh, when you think about all the people that help you to get to where you need to go. Yeah, man, you are really important. Some wisdom on the audience today. This is fantastic. <laughs> it's, it's the, I don't, there's a lot of stuff you shouldn't listen to me on, but there's a few things <laughs> that uh, when, when it comes to my journey in wrestling and, and the broadcasting side, it's, uh, it's, I, 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 I agree. It's, it's, there's a lot of wisdom there. Absolutely. I want to go back and talk about something that we briefly talked about with when we were talking about Tony Ramos. And I mean, I've always wanted to ask you this as well. Besides that Tony Ramos interview, what's maybe one of the more, maybe not even one, maybe a couple of some of the most memorable interviews that you've conducted during your time in Big Ten wrestling? I can think of a few that stick out in my mind, but the yeah, there's a, you know, there's a few, one thing too, that, that is a lot of fun is another thing I love about this job is I never graduate. I never graduate. I get to come back. You know, I've been at the big tens. I've, I've participated in the big 10 championships 10 or 11 times. Like you can't do that as a wrestler, right? You get four cracks at it. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I love is I don't graduate and it's like at the Olympic trials, ran into Sammy Brooks and Sammy and I will be linked forever based on the mullet interview. We'll yeah. be linked forever. So it was great seeing him. We talked, reminisced about the interview. You know, now he's, I think Sammy's, I don't know, 28 years old. I think he said like, he's, he's, these guys are getting to be, I mean, they're men, you know, they're getting, they're getting family. I mean, Ramos is three kids, I think. Yeah. Yep. You know, you know, so that's, that's really cool. It's, it it kind of makes me feel like an old man, but it's, it's how I feel like watching these guys grow up and, you know, have families of their own. And I, I think that's, that's one thing I really love, you know, Matt McDonough has got a couple of kids. I've stayed in touch with Matt. 
So Matt would stand out. Matt McDonough is the first ever interview I did, ever. Really? On the Big Ten Network. And, you know, you remember McDonough, gritty competitor. You know, he'd be one of those guys, and I say it a lot about guys like Matt's eating a box of nails and washing it down with gasoline, right? I mean, Matt McDonough, just tough, tough. And I love that about him. I love how he wrestled. Um, so it was at the Midlands. And I remember going up to him because the other thing too is like, just not, I'm, I'm, I'm not like, for lack of a better way to say it, I'm not an egomaniac. Like, it's just not, mm -hmm. I, I want, I just don't care about it. I just want to do the best job I can, humble myself. I just want to humble myself and be normal. And I, that, that I think people like that, okay? So I went up to McDonough and said, hey, Matt, I want to introduce myself. I'm Shane Sparks with the Big Ten Network. And this is the first, you know, we'd like to interview you if you win. And this is my first interview. This is, and I, I might, I don't know if I, I went as far as to say, I, th I think I said, like, I'd really appreciate if you could help me out. Like, just, he was great. And I remember driving back from, from Northwestern back to Wisconsin. And Jim Gibbons and Doug Brooker was, was our, our producer, I think was his title, producer, director. And they're like, we've never heard McDonough talk like that before. I'm like, yeah, I mean, he was just like, and, and Matt and I joke about, I mean, we, we talk about it. I, I remember that one because it was like, hey, can you just help me out here? Like that, that I think is really important. Get people, you know, you want to be, you know, I, I, I've said this a million times, but if, if you treat people well and you're nice, I think it's just human nature. People are more willing to help you, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. If you're not, it's kind of like, yeah, screw this guy. Like we're not, we're not helping this guy out. That interview will always be important to me because it was the first one, McDonough. Mentioned Ramos, mentioned Brooks, man, th and, and not intentionally, but you got three Hawkeyes there. Yeah. <laughs> Shane Rutherford, when he beat Logan Steber, I'll never forget that one. Just as oh, when he was that, a freshman. When he was a freshman. That one, I will never forget. The other interview that I will never, there's another one that I will never, ever forget, um, was Jason Nolf when he pinned Isaiah Martinez. So we go there and, and I try to be prepared and, you know, we, we want to get the stars. So I, I have like interviews, like a few core questions and it, like Isaiah Martinez. I mean, Jason Nolf, if I'm being honest, I don't know if I knew who he even was. If I'm being real honest, I don't remember if I had even heard of him at that point. So um, we did an interview, a one-on-one -on -one with Isaiah that was supposed to play during the intermission. It never made it to air. Okay. So anyways, I'm ready. Isaiah Martinez is wrestling golf. I'm, you know, I got a few questions for Isaiah because, of course, he's going to beat him. Right. He was undefeated at this time. Undefeated. We're going to do the interview. Be fine. Nolf pins him. And I was like, I can remember the panic. Because <laughs> I was not prepared for this. And like I said before, interview is <laughs> difficult. It's really hard to, I just think it's so difficult. Because you want to ask the right questions. And so Nolf comes off the mat and he is so calm. I, I, he's so calm. It almost made me mad how calm he was. I'm like, you should be celebrating. You just pulled the humongous oh. upset here at U of I. And yep, pins him inside Huff Hall. I get over by him and I'm like, hey, Jason. And I, again, I'm, I'm, I go back to the like honesty card. I go, Jason, I'll be real honest with you. <laughs> I didn't think you'd win. So I don't really know what I'm going to ask you. I didn't have anything prepared. And he looks at me dead serious and just goes, um, this is where I knew Jason Nolf was a savage. Like, holy smokes. He was so calm and he goes, yeah, I, I knew I'd win. I'm like, you got to be flipping kidding me right now. And I, I know he was 100% sincere. I know he was. So all I remember, I all I remember is a little bit of panic. I don't even remember what I asked him. 
I mean, I'm, I'm, I must have come up with something, but I do remember from that interview, his confidence, his laid back demeanor of like, yeah, I, I mean, I knew I'd win. That, that, that will be, I could have Alzheimer's at 90 years old and a rocking chair on the porch. And I will remember Jason Ulf going, yeah, I, I know I'd win. I'll never forget. <laughs> and then I had a little bit of panic. We got through the interview, but I remember walking away from that interview specifically, learn something. Like there I learned, you better be prepared for everything because I didn't like that feeling. I wasn't prepared. I wasn't. And I got through it. And I'm sure if you watched on TV, it was, it was good enough. But if I watched it now, I'd probably be like, man, maybe you could have asked him this. Maybe this would have been better, but you, you can analyze it, you know, all night. But uh, he comes to mind, Mark Hall with the recorder. I remember that one. That was so interesting. I was like, what's happening right now? <laughs> he just pulled yeah, out. Mark Hall with, yeah, he pulls the recorder <laughs> out. What happened there is people started booing. And the reason they started booing was because we were on the Jumbotron but we couldn't see that because it was behind us. So when it came off the Jumbotron, everybody starts booing because they want it back on. And Hall's like, all right, forget it. And that's where I was like, <laughs> come on for me. Can you, you know, can you play the recorder? So that one I remember it was kind of fun. Um, and then you just think back to, you know, now looking back over 10 years, thinking about the guys I've gotten to interview. I mean, that first big tens I ever did at Purdue if I recall correctly, Kellen Russell won his fourth Big Ten title that year. Mm -hmm. So to get to do Kellen Russell winning a fourth title, Steber beat Ramos that year. David Taylor and Ed Ruth, I believe, won their, I believe that was their first of four Big Ten titles. Maybe not. Maybe that was their second. I think Taylor had beaten, I'm going off a of memory here. I think he might have beaten St. John at Northwestern the year before, but you get mm -hmm. the point. When I look back at, all the guys have been able to interview. It's uh, there's a long list of some, some greats because the big 10 is incredible. So there's been, there's been a handful and uh, a lot, a lot of fond memories. And I'll, I'll cherish those for a long time because those were, those were pretty cool opportunities for sure. It is, it is so much fun hearing you talk about those. Cause those guys are my heroes. Those are a lot of kids as heroes. Yeah. So yep. Fascinating. Cause you've, you've talked to more of them than probably anyone else in, in wrestling. So this is really a pleasure and we're getting towards the end of this interview here. So I want to wrap up with one more question. That's uh, I'm going to, it's not really about your experiences. I kind of actually want to pick your brain and get a little bit of advice because I am the assistant wrestling coach here in Fairbury, Illinois at Prairie Central High School. And I want to ask, you've been, you've been immersed in the wrestling world. You have learned so many things, talked to some of the most brilliant minds in the sport. What advice, what's maybe one thing you would tell some high school wrestlers to just keep in mind as they go about their high school careers and maybe even uh, college careers after that? What's something that you think they should keep in mind? I think the first thing that comes to mind is good decisions. That's the first thing that comes to mind for me because I didn't always make good decisions. And somebody once told me, and it's very accurate, bad decisions come with consequences and you don't get to choose those consequences. It's powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I've learned it is what it is. You know, we all make mistakes. I've made some. You learn from them. You hope you do. But that's life is about critical decisions. Yeah. And unfortunately, like I said before, in critical times, I've made some really bad ones and it's, it's affected my life. It is what it is. Okay. Probably speak for a lot of people. But if I was talking to young kids, decision making at critical times, I mean, I got a 17 year old son. We talk about this stuff all the time, you know. You got to, I'm a little wired, a little bit crazy. I mean, I never had a drop of alcohol in high school. I wanted to be a state champion mm -hmm. and there was nothing. I, that meant everything to me. I never thought about drinking in high school. That's just me. I was probably doing other stuff. I should, I don't want to put myself on a pedestal, but commit, you know, commit. Um, if I was a high school, I mean, that would be it. I mean, commit, give it, you know, because if you commit, then there's no second guessing. Like I took second place in Wisconsin and yeah, it bothered me, but I can tell you this, I gave it everything I had. 
I gave it everything I had. There's, and you can live with yourself when you do that. I mean, I, it was max effort. I did all the right things. Just didn't, didn't happen, which whatever. It, it's all worked out for me. You know, I mean, it's all, that's the other thing too. Like some of, some of your biggest disappointments turn out to be some of your greatest blessings. That's another mm-hmm. thing I've learned too over in my, the course of my life. Like, man, I wanted this broadcast opportunity so bad and I didn't get it. But little did I know it's because that door was shutting. So this one could open. Yeah. Like powerful stuff. But, uh, and it just, you know, just enjoy the sport for what it is. You, you know, you don't, I would never tell a kid like, you're never going to wrestle division one. Like I would never tell somebody that mm-hmm. I also, that would never be the expectation. It's it's 1% get to do it. So why don't we, you know, why don't we really focus on other aspects of the sport that are again, like the commitment, the sacrifice, the discipline. I mean, I, I mean, for 45 years old, I'm in pretty good shape. I try to bike four five, six days a week. Why do you think I do that? I mean, why do you think I do that? I'll tell you why I do it. Because in wrestling, that that's what I learned in wrestling. Like, take care of your body. Take care of yourself. Try to eat decent. Like, where do you learn that? Wrestling. So, yeah, it didn't, it didn't get me a national title. But I'd like to think when it's all said and done, it might get me 60 years of doing a few things right. You know, so, you know, that one, enjoy your teammates. Again, you know, going back to gratitude, take care of people that might not be the big dogs, you know, wrestling managers, cheerleaders, your coaches, your parents, your practice partners. Like I'm big into that. I mean, that's if I, if I had to talk to high school kids, I think, I think that's important when it comes to wrestling. I, I would say this every time you put that singlet on, Take like 10 seconds and just pause and realize how fortunate you are that you get to do this. That would be, I, I was talking to this story. Iowa State had me in as an MC last week. They had a, a really cool banquet celebrating. I saw that. Yeah, yeah. I it saw was that. great. I, I love to be in environments where there's a celebration of people, where relationships are highlighted. I mean, watching. There was a a guy there and I don't remember his name, but he was an older gentleman and he gave his name and he said, I'm a three-time national champion. I bet the guy was, he was definitely in his eighties. Like that was powerful to me. And then they introduced David Carr as the most recent national champion. And you get all these national champions and these all Americans. And you could just feel like the love they had for the sport and for each other. Like, Kelly Ward got up. Kelly Ward was a part of the, I believe the 1977 national championship team at Iowa state won a national title in 1979. And he started speaking about Willie Gatson and he couldn't do it. Willie Gatson is Kyvin Gatson's dad. uh, Unfortunately passed away. That's been several years now, but 1977 is a long time ago. And, And to hear him talk about, he talked about, about Willie taking him under his wing and he couldn't talk about it. He was getting choked up, couldn't do it. And I'm just watching that thinking to myself, like, that's what it's about. That's what it's about. The relationships will always be what it's about. Wrestling is a phenomenal avenue that we all love. That's the avenue we use, but it's about the people and the relationships. But um, uh, I, when I was talking to the, this, this group, I mean, it's Iowa State. Too. And I, I don't have a dog in the fight. I love packed arenas. Tim Johnson always said that. What's my favorite arena? A sold out arena. I don't, I don't, and I really don't have, I, I, I love everybody. Like I, I want to see everybody thrive. And I know, you know, try to appreciate the amount of work these guys put into it. So it, when I see two kids wrestling that I have a relationship with both of them, I feel super happy for the guy that wins and I feel horrible for the guy that loses. And it's just like, dang, you know, but, uh, you know, I said I was the Iowa State team, and I would say this again if I was talking to a high school team. When you put that singlet on, look at that name, you know, your school, know what you're representing. Take some time to understand you're representing your family, your name, which is the most important thing you have, and just realizing how lucky you are. Put that singlet on, go out and let it rip. 
That's the message. Pretty simple. Pretty simple. And just real quick, before we totally wrap it up, uh, you said, you know, one door closes, another one opens. We're so grateful to have you here like on the Big Ten Network commentating, doing the commentary for wrestling, doing these post-match interviews. It's incredible. But this wouldn't have happened if you didn't get, I'll say, rejected from that job you wanted being a play-by-play -play analyst or commentator for that minor league baseball team in Wisconsin. Am I, am I right? You used to drop off a resume. Man, you, yeah, you did some research, man. You did some research. That's right, man. <laughs> This is you're you're doing a great job, man. I'm I am I am super impressed with your uh with your questions. <laughs> Thanks. That was that was a disappointing time. I um I wanted to I I, I like sales, you know. So I'm yeah, you always try to think too, like and Jim Gibbons talks about this in our wrestling, you know, broadcast, like what's somebody's path to victory? You know, are you gonna ride the guy? You gotta turn him, you gotta take him down two or three times. Like, what's the path to victory? And I look at that a lot of times with my broadcast and like, what's my path to get to where I got to go? I mean, when the big 10 hired me and I wasn't joking, I was not joking at all. I told them, if you need somebody to clean the bathrooms, I'll do it. I'm fine. I'll come in an hour early, clean the bathrooms. It's not, there's nothing that's below me. I'll do whatever. And uh, so I'll do whatever it takes. So I, Wanted to do a, I, I was hoping I could do a sales job and then baseball play-by-play -play because baseball play-by-play -play is like my ultimate dream, okay? Mm -hmm. So I would go, and, and now the guy's a real good friend of mine. It's funny how this stuff works out. I mean, this is back in 2002, I believe it was. I would drive a, I would take a resume to Fox City Stadium in Appleton. And I would drop it off every day, every day, take a resume there every day. I think on holidays, I would put it in the door handles every day. So I do that for probably, I'm guessing it wasn't that long before they sent me the rejection letter. It might've been three weeks, maybe it was, it was enough to like make my point. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then I get the rejection letter and I can still, re that reject, I have it someplace. It's in a box someplace. Should probably dig it out, look at it some more. But uh, it basically said, you know, I call it the you suck letter. Like, oh suck. man. <laughs> you know, but, but uh, you know, so it's, it's a rejection letter. Thanks, but no thanks. So not long after that, I get hired at the radio station in town to do the sports talk show. And we did a lot of things with the Timber Rattlers. And this guy, you know, Rob Zerjab's an awesome guy, very successful. He was always nice to me. I have a ton of respect for what he's been able to do because he was my age. He was like the youngest, once upon a time, he's like one of the youngest minor league presidents in baseball. I mean, he wasn't old. And I remember once, you know, I just remember being so disappointed, like so disappointed. And, uh, you know, then I, you know, the rest is history, but I remember we had Rob into the radio station once and him and I are doing an interview Whoa. and I'll never forget this. One of my questions to him was, you know, Rob, you know, looking back on your career, you know, you've been doing this maybe at that time, five years, something like that. You know, I said like, you know, what's something you would have maybe done differently. And I was not, I, I can honestly tell you, I, I did not harbor any ill feelings towards him. I, I really, I, it, it motivated me. I was never like angry about it. I always really liked him. I mean, like I said, I could call him up right now and heck, I mean, he's an awesome guy, but I'll never forget. And I did not have, I did not see this coming a million miles away, but he said, not hiring you. And I'll never forget that. Cause it was just like, it, I was like, dang, super, you know, made me feel good. You know, I was like, man, okay. You know, so yeah, you got to hustle. You know, I have a, I, uh, I have a big, a big picture of Pete Rose sliding into third base at Wrigley Field. Picture probably taken in the seventies, if I had to guess. But Pete Rose, when he walked, he hustled the first base. I love hustle. Like sometimes it just comes down to hustle. 
And there's been times I've hustled and gotten things. There's been times I've hustled and not gotten things. Been times I didn't get it. And I think back, man, if you would have hustled it, you would have got it. But you didn't hustle. You didn't, you didn't want it bad enough. Like, <laughs> so, you know, those are, those are just great reminders, but uh, yeah, that's always a good story. Rob would always joke. Cause I, I'd always put the resume in a, like, I think it was a blue folder and he'd make a joke like, yeah, I got a, you know, so I got a stack of folders, you know, on my, you know, on my shelf in my <laughs> office. But uh, that was a real good experience. Just, you know, the other thing too, I've just come to learn is you don't get everything you want and that's, that's okay. You know, kind of, you know, really appreciate what you do have rather than whining about what you didn't get. Hmm. But uh, you know, just keep at it. And like I said before, work hard and uh, treat people right. And, and some good things will happen, but there's been plenty of uh, there's been plenty of, you know, it's peaks and valleys. I mean, for every, you know, great opportunity that you're super jacked up for. There's a, you know, a disappointment that, you know, it's probably a disappointment on something you didn't get, but that's all part of it. It's what makes the, makes it, makes it a fun journey, I guess. Being able to embrace, you know, being able to embrace disappointment. I think that's something I've really tried to, it's a fine line there because you don't want to be like, it's, it's kind of like, you know, show me a happy loser and I'll show you a loser. Like I had to hear some truth to that too. Like things should sting mm-hmm. a little bit, but I, I've tried to implement the last couple of years really being grateful for disappointments. So it's, it's things I'm trying to add to the mindset, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, Shane, your your mindset's fantastic. It, it's really inspiring. It's really moving. It seems like something like a wrestling mindset has really done a lot for you in your life. This whole conversation has been very enlightening, very educational. I have more than enjoyed it. It's you know this is a this is a dream come true, really. This uh, this podcast interview. So thank you so much for your time. I'm sure that your words are going to be really valuable to the listeners. And yeah, just thank you for coming on. I'm going to leave you with this. You're, you said you're 23 years old. That's correct. Yeah, <laughs> I would have been, I believe, 26. I think I was. I was 26 years old. One of my first broadcast jobs was being in the visiting clubhouse at Miller Park and getting sound bites from the visiting team. And if I remember right, that year the Brewers lost over 100 games. So I was always in. I was always in a happy clubhouse which makes a difference. I remember standing in the clubhouse once and Marty Brenneman, the longtime Hall of Fame voice, came into the clubhouse. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's Marty Brenneman. Like one of the all-time greats. And he looked at me and he goes, he either said, I I believe he said, good to see you. And I was like, oh my gosh. Like, are you kidding me? Like, (laughs) I just, I just, actually had an engagement, an encounter with Marty Brenneman. Like, this is unbelievable. So a year later, I was probably 27 years old. I, I'm doing the sports talk show, and I used to get all the big hitters interview-wise. Like, I, I'd, get, I'd always want to get, like, the top play-by-play guys. So I get Marty Brenneman on, just like you and I are doing. Mm-hmm. I was a little older than you, but not much. And... I'm all prepared. I do the interview with Marty Brenneman and he said something to me that I'll never forget. It was, it made me feel so good. And I'm going to tell you the exact same thing. He ended the interview with you ask fine questions, young man. I will never forget him telling me that. So thank you so much for having me on. And I would leave you with this. You ask fine questions. young man. (laughs) Well done. Well done. Uh, Thanks Shane. It has been a pleasure, man. You are, you are awesome. Thanks for the time. Absolutely.